So uh, just last Wednesday, uh, Pastor Thompson was here, and he shared his, his, was reflecting on the North and South Korea situation and the challenge of how do you bring unity and how are we going to see uh, unification of the Korean Peninsula. So it got me thinking about what are the most fundamentals of our unification understanding and divine principle is about relationships. The divine principle is, is built on uh, explaining that we live, we're designed by God to live in relationship. And at the very beginning, those relationships were broken. And there's a pattern of relationships that we have to fix, that we have to heal. So, and we call that in our unifications lingo, the Cain Abel relationship or challenge. And I figured it's worthwhile for us to always look at this again because we also get strange concepts about what does it mean to be Cain and what does it mean to be Abel. And just relationship 101 is what is the nature of the Cain Abel relationship and how does that apply to us, particularly when we're trying to live lives of living for the sake of others. So the story starts out from the, the Old Testament. This is the story from the book of Genesis. Cain and Abel are the children of Adam and Eve. So we're talking about the very first family uh, in God's history. And I'll read, this is from uh, Genesis, the fourth chapter, um, and the, the second verse on. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his livestock. The Lord looked on favor with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. And then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Very important line there, right? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But... If you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Sad end of that story. <laughs> So I believe that the sin that was crouching at the door actually took hold of Cain. So this is the first story of sibling rivalry, right? Sibling rivalry. Anybody ever feel jealous of your brother or sister? How come they got something and I didn't get it, right? So this is the case way back in the very first story of Cain and Abel in the family. And the challenge that we face is we're also in the process of restoring and healing that kind of relationship because that problem happens to every one of us in all aspects of our lives. So let's look briefly at the cain Abel relationship. First, this is a pattern that um, to restore not only uh, the problem between brothers, but it's a historical problem. But I'm going to focus on how it applies to us. So for Cain, what kind of feelings do you think Cain had when God said, oh, I like what Abel did. No, nope, I don't like what you did. What do you think uh, Cain was feeling? Jealous. He was feeling jealous. Oh, jealousy is a big one, right? What else? Angry. Angry. Yeah, probably pretty upset. Oh, it's not fair. What else? Unloved. Unloved, right? Not appreciated. Anybody ever felt any of those things? You know, I haven't. No. <laughs> Maybe I have. <laughs> no, everybody feels that, right? Jealousy, even the feeling resentful. Oh, you know, really, you know, kind of bitter. Why isn't this fair? And, of course, angry. So those are feelings that, you know, it's easy for us to get. The challenge is this is part of our fallen nature. We very easily feel jealous towards others. We very easily get resentful when we feel our feelings are hurt and, and get angry. So, how about Abel? How do you think he felt when God gave him this blessing and, and, and rejected his, his older brother's blessing? Superior. 
He thought he was superior, right? Whoa, ho, I'm the good stuff. What else? Proud, very really proud, arrogant even. Happy. happy. Oh, I'm sure he was happy. Wouldn't you be happy if you got the blessing from God? Yeah. What else? Yeah, love. Huh? Boastful. Boastful. Yeah, arrogant. Boastful and arrogant. Yeah, I think definitely he felt really happy. That was the first thing. But happy on the, ah, oh, so I'm so satisfied with myself. <laughs> I'm so good. Because it's very easy when we get the blessing to be selfish, to be self-centered, thinking, oh, this is so good. I am so great. I got this blessing, right? <laughs> I'm so happy. And I'm self selfish, right? It's easy to be selfish. And, like a couple of you said, boastful, proud, arrogant. It's easy to do that. But you saw what happened when Cain is feeling jealous, resentful, and angry, and his brother is feeling happy and selfish and a little bit arrogant and showing off. What happens? Cain kills his brother. <laughs> Anybody ever wanted to kill your brother or your sister? It felt like it. You didn't do it, fortunately, right? <laughs> but it's easy to have that feeling, right? Oh! So how do we deal with that? This pattern is not just with, with an old Bible story. This pattern is all over our lives. And it's challenges that we have to face. Now, this problem between Cain and Abel, it's also historical from the divine principle understanding to restore uh, the problem between the archangel and Adam and Eve that led to the very fall of, of, of humankind. So God tried with Cain and Abel. He warned Cain. He said, you know, it don't, if you do right, don't you know you'll be blessed? But if you don't, Satan's after you. Well, that failed. So God tried again. In the Bible, we hear the story about Noah and Noah's family. That failed again. Then God tried again with Abraham. That was kind of successful, but not complete. So then his son, Isaac, he tried and finally came down to Isaac's family, his sons, Jacob and Esau. So let's leave the Bible story uh, about Jacob and Esau. This comes from the 25th chapter of, of Genesis. We're still in the first book of the Bible. And... Um, so here's, here's uh, the story about Jacob and Esau when they were born. This is Genesis chapter 25, the 23rd verse. When the time came for her to give birth, that's Rebecca, Isaac's uh, wife, there were, two, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. His brother, after this, his brother came out and with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. You know, there's an expression, Jacob, in, in the Jewish, where you grab onto something and kind of try to get benefit from the other person. So it's kind of a, 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 an expression. So that's why he was named Jacob, because he was holding on, holding on. Now, Isaac really loved Esau, because Esau, you know, he went out hunting and, you know, all this great stuff. And Rebecca really loved Jacob. Because Jacob liked to stay home and cook and help with his mom. And <laughs> so in, as they grew older, when Esau, Isaac is about to die and pass on the blessing to his oldest son, Rebekah helps Jacob so that Jacob gets, receives the blessing from his father instead of Esau. So how do you think Esau would feel about that? Angry. Jealous and resentful. He took my blessing, right? <laughs> he took my blessing. It, it says so in the Bible. In, this is in the 27th chapter of Genesis. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, The day of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. So he wants to kill him. Right? As soon as his father is sick and dies, so they do have a period where they mourn the death of their father. But after that's done, Jacob is done. <laughs> too. I'm going to kill him. Right? That's what Esau was feeling like. <sighs> kind of hard. Fortunately, his mom helps Jacob escape. <laughs> he says, look, go stay with my, my brother, his, uh, Jacob's uncle Laban. 
and he escapes uh, to the land of Haran, where he spends 21 years. Actually, in the unification term, we talk about he paid indemnity. He actually had a lot of difficulties in Iran, a hard time. He was working for his uncle, who was kind of a mean slave master, kept, oh, come on, you know, and kept cheating him, all kinds of things. But 21 years he was there. Finally, he decides, OK, I'm going to go back home and see if I can reconcile with my brother. So he sends a message back to Esau. Says, OK, let's, let's meet up. So then, now, now we're all the way in the 32nd chapter of Genesis. And this is what it says. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we went to see your brother Esau, and now he's coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. Hmm, that doesn't sound so great. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and the herds and the camels as well. Jacob knew something was up. He was nervous, right? He was scared. And he instructed the one in the lead, when my brother Esau meets you, you uh, meets you and asks, who do you belong to and where are you going and who owns all these animals in front of you, then you are to say, they belong to your servant Jacob. They are a gift sent to my lord Esau, and he is coming behind us. So. After Jacob sends all these gifts forward, Jacob is preparing. And he, they, he crosses the fort of Jabbok, and he has a really tough night that night. In the story of the Bible, he actually ends up wrestling with an angel. An angel comes, and is holding him, and, and Jacob doesn't let him go. And he fights the angel all night long. It's kind of like when you, you know you have to do something that you really don't want to do. <laughs> Sometimes you have to struggle in a lot of internal difficulties. Well, Jacob had to struggle with this angel, but he was victorious. And actually, in the end, the angel said, OK, I give you the name of Israel. So actually, that's where Israel comes from, you know, when we talk about the, the nation of Israel. So finally, the day comes, and he's about to go meet his brother. So this is the story in Genesis 33. Jacob looked up, and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. <laughs> so Jacob divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and their children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. Then he himself went on ahead and then bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. Bet he's pretty nervous, right? But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. That's a victory. Oh, whew. <laughs> Jacob going, who knows what's going to happen with Esau and his 700, his 400 soldiers are ready to, to kill him, right? But they wept as brothers and came together, and actually this is a great victory for God. Because the, that pattern, that problem that started with the archangel and Adam and Eve, and we could see clearly in Cain and Abel that resentment and anger and so that the brothers kill each other, finally it was, the pattern was broken. Very important for God's providence. But also in our lives, it's a very important breakthrough for us as God's children. But let's see. The divine principle emphasizes how important this moment was. And this is from the province of restoration in Abraham's family. The divine principle says, Esau and Jacob secured the positions in which Cain and Abel had stood at the moment when God accepted Abel's offering. Right? So Abel refused the blessing. He's very happy. Cain is feeling jealous and angry and resentful. Right? Esau and Jacob had that same situation. Indeed, when Jacob returned to Canaan with his family and wealth after enduring 21 years of hardship in Haran, he moved Esau to overcome his former hostility. This is so significant in God's providence 
And I encourage you, you know, if you don't have, if you have an opportunity to study divine principle with us and look at how God was working through history to heal the hurts, the problems of history, and build a world of true love and true peace. But for us, it's also really significant in terms of our relationships with people. So let's look at the details. The Esau and Jacob relationship, we have Esau who's feeling jealous, right? Oh, it's not fair. My, the brother got the blessing, not me. He's even feeling angry and resentful, right? How about Jacob? Now, this is where the story changes for the better. Jacob, instead of feeling, oh, I'm so great, and I'm so happy, and I'm so blessed, he ended up going a very difficult way. He ended up going a course of sacrificing and suffering. When he went to Haran, he had a, when you read in the Bible story, he had a difficult time when he was in Haran. So instead of just being so happy, I got all the good stuff, he actually went and sacrificed and served. Also, when we read in the story, when he comes back to read his brother, he's very generous, right? He sends forward all this wealth and, and stuff and says, this is for you, my brother, because I love you. So he's very generous. He's not being selfish and keeping it, oh, I got all the blessings, it's all for me, none for you, just for me. No, he wasn't like that at all. He, he, he was very generous in, in helping and in, in, in giving. And then he also was humble. You know, he went up. It's not easy to bow down to someone else, right? But he bowed down to his brother and expressed love and care for his brother. This is where the victory was. Jacob, because of his heart, because of going this difficult course of 21 years, that's a long time, right? Going that difficult way, but keeping a generous heart and being humble, he was able to change Esau's mind and Esau's feelings. So if we think about these relationship positions, we are always experiencing Cain and Abel relationships. And we experience them both. Sometimes we're Cain, sometimes we're Abel. So what does that mean? Sometimes we're Cain means sometimes I feel like I didn't get enough. <laughs> I feel like it's not fair. <laughs> I feel jealous, right? I feel something's like someone else got more than me. That's not fair, right? <laughs> it's easy to feel like. Or someone knows more or has more than me. I feel a lacking in myself. That happens to us all the time, especially if we compare ourselves a lot, and which is not, always a, is not a healthy thing to do. But when we're in that cane position, we feel like I don't, I'm missing something. Something's missing. Now, to, even though we feel that, and that's natural, it's not a problem, that's not evil to feel like, oh, I don't, didn't get enough. But if we, in that position, we have to resist feeling jealous. So can, instead of being jealous about, oh, the person who has a lot, can we actually appreciate and feel, wow, they did something great. Huh. Good for them. Instead of, ah, I wish I'd gotten that, <laughs> right? When someone else wins, so, oh, they shouldn't have. I wish I'd gotten that prize, right? It's so easy. So we have to resist that. We have to resist being jealous. And we need to be able to humble ourselves and willing to receive from that other person. You know, when someone gets someone, they say, oh, here, you want some of this? Sometimes we're kind of like, no. I'm too proud. I don't want that. <laughs> but, you know, someone who got the blessing and they're willing to share, you know, they got, they got this big basket of cookies, right? <laughs> so, oh, oh, these cookies are so good. These co oh, I wish you'd gotten some of them. They taste so great. <laughs> you know, they didn't make you feel good, right? <laughs> but if they say, oh, here, have some. Are you going to say, no, I want my own? <laughs> I don't want your cookies. I want my own cookies. No. If we're actually willing to receive, then we can also get the blessing. Sometimes we close ourselves off from being able to receive when someone wants to help us, wants to give to us. And also, just appreciating the person who's in the able position, the person who's in the blessed position, the person who has something to give. Instead of feeling jealous or angry towards them, we can appreciate them. Be happy for them. 
that they are successful in what they've done. Now, on the other side, sometimes we're the ones that got the blessing. We're the ones who have the fortune that, that have the knowledge or the wisdom or got the, 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 good, the good stuff, right? So when we're in that position, we need to, number one, be grateful for the blessing that we have. Be grateful that we have something that we can share with others. To be grateful and to be humble. You know, Abel's problem is so easy to be arrogant. We have to resist that tendency to be arrogant and thinking, oh, I'm so much better. No, we have to be grateful for the blessing we have and be humble and ready to serve, ready to use them. God designed us because he wants to bless us. He designed us to be able to multiply the blessings that we receive. If I get all these great cookies and I just enjoy them myself, well, I have fun. But if I share that blessing with other people, I'm multiplying happiness. Actually, it makes me happy too when I see the people I, I shared my blessing with and it made them happy. So if we're ready to serve, and this is an attitude that we want to cultivate and nurture in our life. That's why your, your parents are always telling you, you, know, you have to help your brothers and sisters. You have to help out in the house. <laughs> That's why we always have to practice living for the benefit of others, serving and helping others. And finally, genuine heart of love of Cain is cares about people who don't have the blessing. Who, people who have less than we have. Underlying all of this is the thought and attitude of living for the benefit of others. If I'm in the Cain position and I feel, oh, I don't have enough, but I'm living for the benefit of others, then I am, I'm grateful and I appreciate what other people are doing. And if I'm in the position where I'm receiving blessing and I'm living for the benefit of others, then I want to share that. I want other people to be happy too. I want to multiply that. So our relationships, these Cain and Abel experiences happen in every one of our relationships. Now, if you think about fellow students at school, maybe sometimes we feel jealous when someone got an A on the test and you didn't do so well, right? <laughs> oh, I'm in the Cain, I don't know, that person. If they hadn't gotten a high score, then it wouldn't, the, the, you know, the curve, they messed up the curve, right? <laughs> but instead, if we think, well, they must have studied hard. They know something. Actually, there's something I can receive from them, something I can learn from them. Maybe they can help me, right? And if you're the person who got that A in the class and everyone else got C's and D's and failed, you walk around and say, oh, you guys are all so stupid. I'm so smart. <laughs> no. <laughs> you should think, hey, I, I, I'm happy. I'm so grateful that I understood this material. You know, I studied and I, and I got it. I can, maybe I can help the other people understand. So I can help other people. I can share the blessing that I have. Same thing with coworkers in our, in our workplace. You know, if someone gets a promotion, can we be happy for them? And can we, you know, receive through them? And when we get the promotion, you know, are we going to, oh, I'm so much better than you. See, I got a promotion and you didn't. Bad, bad. Those kind of ables get killed. Right? <laughs> no, we love. You know, we got we got more blessings, so we can help other people. We can help other people, and, and this applies not just in you know school or work, but if you think about society, there's unfortunately, particularly in the past hundred years or so, Marxist philosophy has taught us to be victims. You know, the, there's the rich and the poor. In the past. Especially in America. Now, in other countries it was different. But when you came to America, the feeling was, in America, anyone who works hard can prosper and become rich. And so poor people didn't resent rich people. They said, oh, I want to be like that. <laughs> you know, they would feel, yeah, that person's rich. I can do that you know, if I work hard. But with Marxist thinking and the kind of promoting of a Victim mentality is like, oh no, that person's rich. I'm jealous, I'm angry, I'm resentful, and they made me poor. You know, Karl Marx called it the, the oppression of the poor, you know, by the rich. And that, that, you know, in creating that kind of enemy thinking, well, that's not healthy. 
if, when we're in the cane position, we know we need to do more, maybe we're in the poor position, then we look and see, okay, what can I learn from people who are succeeding? What can I learn? You know, what am I doing? Maybe I'm doing something, I, if I do something different, I can be more successful. If I'm on the successful side, am I looking to support others in learning how they can break through, how they can be successful? So this is, this cane able relationship, it appears all over the place. Even at the national level, right? America is without a doubt a blessed nation. We have received so many blessings from God, so much for us to be thankful for. We have so much to give to the world. And fortunately, and historically, we've done a pretty good job of helping other countries. But, you know, it's easy to get arrogant. And people don't want to receive so much when you're arrogant. Oh, I'm so good. Here, I'll give you some of my leftovers. <laughs> no, that's not the kind of heart that really helps people. So we can cultivate, especially as a nation. I have Father Moon and Mother Moon often call America the elder son nation. We're the one that has the blessing that we can help others, help all of our other brothers and sisters around the world. So even if we think about it at our own family level, each one of us is incredibly blessed. Number one, we know true parents. We know the divine principle. We have an opportunity to participate in the transformation of history. An incredible blessing. We know and understand more and more about God's deep, loving heart and suffering heart. We have so many blessings. Can we not share those with others? Can we not care for people who don't have it? Not with the attitude of, oh, see, I'm so smart. I know the divine principle, and you're so wrong in your understanding of, of the reading the Bible or this. No, that's arrogance. Those kinds of Abel's get killed. They are not loving. Father Moon over and over tells us, live for the sake of others. Genuine love means when we're in Cain's position, we appreciate and love those who have the blessing. And we support them and we're happy for them. And when we're in the blessed position, in Abel's position, then we care about the people who have less than we do. It's just a natural system that works. You don't need to pass a law that says, oh, you can't make that much money. If you make this much money, we're going to take it away and give it to somebody else. You, know, you don't need to pass laws for that. People's hearts go, hey, I have this wealth. Let me do something that benefits others. So this Cain and Abel is probably one of the most fundamental teachings of the divine principle. It's a very simple concept. You know, How do we overcome the resentment when I'm in Cain? And how do we love and care for my Cain when I'm in Abel position? But it's very, very practical. It applies to every aspect of our life, especially when we think about our mission in life is to live for the sake of others. That's where we're going to find the greatest joy and the greatest fulfillment, when we make a positive difference in the lives of the people around us. And the key place to do that is where? Starting in our family, our home church, and with our tribe, the people in our family, in our community, the people, uh, our relatives, and the people around us. We have so many opportunities. Let's pay attention and be people who can always give love, no matter what position we're in, when we're in the Cain position or the Abel position, when we have the blessing or we don't have the blessing. No matter what, we can give love and we can break through. Let me close with this from, from Father Moon. Not only God himself, but also true human beings accept the principle that they need to exist for the sake of others. That is why love stems from living for the sake of others. Why the true ideal stems from living for the sake of others. And why true peace and true happiness can be found only when one lives for the sake of others. This is actually a speech he gave uh, in, in Korea uh, called A World of Living for the Sake of Others. It was on the Day of Hope tour. He concluded his speech by saying, I hope that through this event you have embraced this principle of living, of existing for the sake of others and that you will now embody it by practicing it in your homes, and workplaces. 
on the day you begin living in such a manner and you will see a future more and more hopeful and joyful unfold and you will discover yourselves boldly fulfilling central responsibilities as the pioneers of tomorrow. So, can we do it? Can we live for the sake of others? Can we live a life of genuine service and making a difference in the world around us? That's the key for us to find joy and fulfillment in our lives. So, please join me in prayer. Good morning, Father, Mother, God, Honorable Manem. Thank you for your precious love and the design of this universe that, that supports and empowers us when we live for the sake of others. Holy Parent, sometimes it's so hard to, to appreciate that and, and so scary because we feel like if, if we give away the, the things that we have, then we'll be lost, we, we will be losing. But because of your love, always when we give out of genuine love and care, it fills up, we fill up again with your love and your presence. Heavenly Parent, we want to be the sons and daughters that you can count on, the ones that you can work through, to be a blessing in our community, in the world around us. Please guide us, especially in the responsibility and the trust you've given us to be tribal messiahs, living for the benefit of the larger community and serving others. Heavenly Parent, as your sons and daughters, we gratefully thankful and offer and determine ourselves again to you. Amen and adieu. Okay, so please turn to your neighbor and share stories about your successes and challenges as Cain and Abel loving brothers and sisters.